is part one of a multiple part series on keys to understanding Bible symbols. If you wish to understand any subject, you first need to know what the word understand implies. It means to stand under the surface of the subject. So, as an example, if you're going to put a lot of weight on the second floor of a building, like printing presses or something very heavy, uh, the thing to do is to go downstairs first with a building inspector and look at the foundation of the floor that you're going to build on. So what you're doing is you're standing under the foundation to get understanding. That's where the idea and the concept of understanding comes from, is to stand under the foundation you're going to build on to get understanding. So, to understand the particular Bible subject I want to discuss, we need to first read a scripture from the Christian New Testament, 1 Corinthians 15, 14, from the Holy Bible. At 1 Corinthians 15, 14, an interesting comment is made. It says, And if Christ has not been risen, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. So, in reading this scripture brings us to the subject at hand, the New Testament story of Jesus. A story which, when read and understood correctly, is in fact a very old story indeed. This truly ancient and fascinating story has been referred to as astrotheology, or the retelling of an ancient story. Let's begin. The Judeo-Christian Bible tells of a wonderful story. It is, in fact, often referred to as the greatest story ever told. And so it is, and you're now about to find out why. In the New Testament of the Christian Bible, a provocative and most serious challenge is laid on the whole of Christianity. Since it bears directly on our subject, we will quote it here. Again, we go back to 1 Corinthians 15, 14, where it says, If Christ be not risen, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is also in vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. And if Christ be not risen, your faith is in vain, and you are yet in your sins. In the New Testament, there is a warning given to all who would build a house. Namely, before you lay the foundation, find out what the foundation itself will rest on. Solid rock or sand? The reason is obvious. Or said another way, you need to stand under the foundation to get a true understanding. So let's talk about the foundations of Christianity. Let's closely examine the original conceptual foundations of the faith and then decide if Christ be not risen. But in order to do that, we must go back not 2,000 years to the birth of Christ, but 8 to 10,000 years to the birth of modern man. For when one seeks to establish foundations, one must begin at the beginning. Many thousands of years ago, in what we refer to as the primordial world of the ancients, human life was far different experience to that which we enjoy today. While it is true that we have less documentation on that prehistoric world that we have on our own age, ample enough is known from the ancient writings to paint a rather clear picture of our primitive ancestry. If we have learned anything at all, it is this, that the more we change, the more we stay the same. And nowhere is this more clearly demonstrated than in the history of man's quest for God and the ancient religion that we still keep holy today. 
According to the best understanding we have gleaned from the available records, life for our ancient forefathers was a mixture of wonder and fear. Each day just finding food for one's family without becoming a meal yourself from the roaming predator animals was a life and death struggle. And if you've ever ventured out into the cold night with insufficient clothing, and without friend or family near, you can quickly see how fearful the dark, cold, primordial nights could be. And then came winter. It was from these meager and distressful conditions of the human race that our long history of the search for God and meaning has come. Any evolution at its most accelerated rate is always agonizingly slow. But from the beginning, man's profound questions demanded answers. And when no answers were forthcoming from the universe, man turned inward and developed his own. Keep in mind that, not, that all of the theological teachings of the Western world were developed in the Northern Hemisphere. This is important, so I will say that again. Let's read it again. Keep in mind that all the theological teachings of the Western world were developed in the Northern Hemisphere. The study of this subject is properly called Astrotheology or the Worship of the Heavens. To begin with, astrotheology. This is the first, original, and therefore the oldest, and most respected story on the earth. It did not take ancient man very long to decide that in this world, the single greatest enemy to be feared, and think about this in the ancient prehistoric world, that the greatest enemy to be feared was the darkness of night and all the unknown dangers that came with it. Simply stated, man's first enemy was darkness. Understanding this one fact alone, people can readily see why the greatest and most trustworthy friend the human race could ever have was by far heaven's greatest gift to the world that glorious rising orb of day, the sun. The oldest religious concept in the history of the earth is the idea of the war between heavenly light and the evil of darkness. Even comic books today portray and talk about the war between light and darkness. Light and darkness, the continual flow of the war between 12 hours of day and 12 hours of night. The sun dominates the day, the moon dominates the night. The black against the white, concepts, taking all the way back to the concept of the half the earth is in darkness, while the other half is in light, and there's a continual, perpetual war between the light and darkness on the earth. So therefore, the sun and the moon are always at odds. The sun brings the light of day, and the moon dominates the darkness of night. So we've seen it uh, illustrated in books and magazines the war between the sun and the moon, or the war between the light of day and the darkness of night. Here we see the sun doing battle with the darkness of night. Here on a church you will see the sun on one side, the moon on the other. Astral theology, the worship of the heavens. The same concept we see in the Bible, New Testament story, between God's Son 
and his battle with the Prince of Darkness, because Jesus is said to be the light of the world, while the devil is the Prince of Darkness, again the war between light and darkness. So let's go back to the prehistoric beginnings of the greatest story ever told which is the symbolic acknowledgement of our Heavenly Savior, God's Son, S-U-N, the light of the world. Well, of course, the S-U-N is the light of the world. Many times, even today in photography, the sun appears to be in the middle of a, of a cross between the four equal cross of the sun. And so the ancient peoples, we're talking about prehistoric and ancient peoples, uh, drew their symbol of the sun to what we call today the wheel cross or the sun cross or the Odin or Woden's cross. It was simply two crosses, it was a cross within a circle. Here in Sweden, we find a 12,000-year-old Swedish rock painting with the sun cross, 12,000 years old. Here we have another circle cross, which is called a petroglyph cross. These petroglyph crosses are quite literally around the world. All the ancient and prehistoric cultures pictured the cross on the sun. So, here's another one, sun wheel rock carvings. This one was found in Denmark. This is 2000 BC. This is 2000 years before the Christian era. The ancient man was drawing what he perceived to be the sun and put a cross in the middle, the sun cross. At the top you'll see sun crosses. So these sun crosses are the ancient petroglyph uh, sun crosses of the ancient peoples. Here's another one, 4,000 B.C. That's 6,000 years ago. 4,000 B.C., you'll see a sun wheel they discovered in, in Sweden. Sun wheels, the cross within a circle. As I said, these old petroglyph, ancient prehistoric uh, paintings and drawings of the sun. So keeping that in mind that this is an ancient petroglyph sun and here combining the sun with man and woman we have the sun man, man who was created by the sun. We see in the old Bronze Age petroglyph man and the sun. Uh, ancient Hindu sun symbols. The ancient Hindu gods carried the same concept. You'll see the sun and the moon on the outside. Ancient Egyptian sun symbols. At the top you will see the old ancient uh, cross within the circle for the sun. On her headdress, headdress you will see the equal armed cross. Here in the old Coptic religion in Egypt, you'll see the sun on the cross, the round circle with the equal arms on the cross, the sun on the cross. Hitler and the Nazis also use this old ancient prehistoric petroglyph sun symbol, still used today. The Nazis used it. They used it on their flags, they used it in symbols on the concentration camps, and in their parades, as you will see the swastika, but behind the swastika is the sun cross. That's because a swastika also represented the sun, but it was on the square, while the round one was the old petroglyph sun cross. Here we see that same concept of the sun cross, the Nazis used on their planes, and the Catholic uh, priest wears on his vestments. We see the Catholic priest 
Catholic Church uses the old ancient petroglyph sun cross in their worship of God's Son, the light of the world. And all the Egyptian and all the European royalty and the governments around the world also use it too. Here we see the old ancient god Dysolus. Solus is the sun. God, the I-E-S, is God of the sun. And you'll see the sun god in his chariot with the horses because the sun was many times pictured as a sun in a chariot being pulled across the sky uh, by horses in his chariot. The sun roams across the sky. The French military used the sun cross in their huts. The kings and uh, emperors in Europe, even God the Father in the Catholic Church. Uh, we see pictures of God the Father with Jesus in heaven, and even God the Father doesn't realize he's holding an old ancient uh, petroglyph pagan cross, which is thousands and thousands of years old. Here are the kings, as I said, dramatic rulers using the sun cross. And here in Germany at the gate in Germany, you'll see the horses pulling the sun cross across heaven, used in the, many times many of the yards of the castles in Europe were designed like sun crosses. Yeah, and here's the uh, the new European Union using the old ancient petroglyph cross. And here's um, the Queen Mum. One of her badges she's wearing is the old sun cross. So this sun cross has been used, and keeping in mind that all of these new uses are actually just using the old ancient petroglyph sun cross going back many thousands of years. Here in Oslo, here are the uh, Nordic peoples using the old sun cross on, the, uh, on their shields of war. So it's been used for thousands of years. And it is said and as I said, you will find this ancient petroglyph sun symbol all around the world. Here it is in the Vatican, the sun cross representing the sun in the Vatican with the crown of thorns, which is nothing more than the sun rays. Rings with sun crosses. This is from the museum in Denmark from the Bronze Age found artifacts. Uh, in Jerusalem, there are cemeteries and burial mounds that have sun crosses on them. Uh, on columns, you'll see sun crosses. You know, professional and even in uh, corporate logos and coins of the ancient world. Uh, so sun crosses were everywhere. The old ancient petroglyph sun cross still today can be found around the world. Even the Ku Klux Klan uses it. Again, you'll see the sun in the middle with the old cross, the equal arm cross. And of course, it forms the very basis of modern day Christianity, which is only to be expected for after all, God's son is the light of the world. In John 8, 2, in the New Testament, we, we read where Jesus said, says, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. When you understand that Jesus is a metaphor for the sun, that thing which comes up in the morning, which brings light into the world, then Jesus is a metaphor for the sun. And therefore, it rightly can be said that the sun that comes up in the morning speaks to, of itself as the light of the world. Well, of course, the sun is the light of the world. What else lights the world if it's not the sun? Of course, the sun does not belong to us. It belongs to God. So it's God's sun who is the light of the world. 
Here in every single time you ever see Jesus, he will always be pictured with a sun or the sun cross around his head. Always Jesus is referred to as God's son, S-U-N, the light of the world, our risen savior. Even as I said, in the ancient world, you had sun men combining the ancient sun with man. Man and the Son. God's Son gives life to man. Now you will see the old petroglyph cross in the Eastern Orthodox Church. You'll see it in the Catholic Church. You'll see it in the beautiful churches in the East, on Christmas trees, uh, the Catholic um, symbols that they wear in the churches. This particular ceremony looks really scary. But then again, there's a lot about the Catholic Church that is scary. But you'll see the sun cross being worn. And again, I remind you that the kings in Europe and God Almighty, with Jesus up in heaven, are displaying the old ancient petroglyph sun cross. You've got to ask yourself why. Here are uh, some, here's a phenomena that started a few years ago. Uh, young people uh, in the Western world gathering around the old ancient petroglyph sun cross. And uh, I think they do this in September. And it's called uh, See You at the Pole, where Christians in colleges or high schools get together and circle around the old petroglyph sun cross uh, to commemorate their admiration for their God, uh, Jesus, or God's Son, the light of the world. And so they are gathering around the old petroglyph sun symbol, never realizing for a minute all of this is pagantry from thousands of years ago. As I said in the beginning, the more we change, the more we stay the same. We're still worshiping the old petroglyph ancient sun. Here in the Catholic Church, you'll see the priest raising the host and above the raising of the host in the Catholic Church is quite simply showing that the sun is risen. It's rising. And you'll see on the altar the great sun cross. And don't forget the Catholic communion host bread. And Catholics, when they take first communion or when they take a communion at, on Sunday at Mass, the communion wafer is always a circle with a cross in the middle, the sun cross. Because this is simply the idea that Christians are eating a part of their God. Their God is the God of the sun, the sun God. God's sun, the light of the world. And if you're going to, and symbolically, eat of his flesh and eat of his body, well, then you're eating of God's Son. It's everywhere in the church. You will see that the host is the Son. Again, the Sun Cross is everywhere in the Catholic Church. Also in the Catholic Church, the Sun God, or the old ancient petroglyph Sun, is, uh, is also here in, in Israel, you'll see the petroglyph Sun. And even the so-called Protestant Church world is also following the lead of the pagan Rome's worship of the prehistoric petroglyph Sun. The Protestant world likes to think of itself as totally, totally different from the Catholic Church. And point of fact, there's no difference whatsoever. Uh, this is a very important book you can buy called The Sun in the Church, Cathedrals as Solar Observatories. And of course, that's what cathedrals and churches are. <clears throat> they are, <clears throat> that's what cathedrals are. And churches are solar observatories. And you'll see the uh, sun on the church. Churches use the old petroglyph 
thousands and thousands of years old, representing the ancient worship of the sun. Again, God's sun is the light of the world. That's what Christianity is all about. You will see it on all churches throughout the world. It's the same story. This is just a few of the quite literally hundreds, if not thousands, of examples I could show you of those who submit themselves to the pagan worship of the sun god. All churches. You will see the petroglyph sun everywhere if you just look. You need to open your eyes and begin to see things around you. You'll see it on this uh, bookmarker. Ancient sun worship has been around as long as man's been on the earth. That's absolutely true. <clears throat> Here's a painting of a beautiful painting of the um, ancient peoples worshiping and welcoming the newborn Savior each morning. The sun would rise, and he was referred to as our risen Savior. Now, of course, the sun is your risen Savior. It rises each morning, and it is your Savior. Because if it doesn't rise, we're dead in about three weeks. So the sun brings warmth and life and energy and life to the earth. So it's only fitting that humans would worship the presence of the great sun, our risen Savior, our Savior. The ancient Egyptians had a winged sun disk. Again, this is another classic example about how uh, the sun was pictured as rolling or marching across the sky or being pulled across the sky in a chariot. Here on the Aztecs and Maya from South America, you will see uh, the sun on the altar behind the priest. People bowing and worshiping the sun to the east. Here in India, the sun god is worshipped. Here again in the Aztec, Maya, Inca culture, all over South America, you will find pictures like this uh, and the, of the priest bowing down on the altar, um, showing obeisance to the sun. So even in the South America and Central America, they are still involved in the worship of God's sun, the light of the world. It's all ancient sun worship. You find it all over the world. In the Orient, and here, the choir at the uh, Oxford University, they're singing a hymn. Oxford University, young people singing hymns to the rising sun. Here we have a woodcut of uh, ancient Jewish idolatry, worshiping the sun. Here again, it's a picture of the ancient Hebrews and the temple waiting for the sun to rise so they can bow down and praise God's sun, the light of the world. And of course, at the Vatican, which is the headquarters for Christian sun worship on the earth, the Vatican. And here is the four, uh, the four Bible writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Spring, summer, autumn, winter. And all are writing about their God in the middle, the sun. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the four seasons. The sun and the church, cathedrals as solar observatories. As I said, this is a very important book that you might want to get in the library. Here's another church, and you'll see the sun on the ceiling, sun on the walls, sun in the, on the uh, altars, 
in Europe, the sun, always the sun on the altars, because this is the basis for, and this is even in Japan, you will see them bowing down, praying to their god, the sun. Armenians have the sun on their altars, more of sun on the altars. The churches have the rising sun. So everywhere you look in Christianity, you will see sun worship. This is why Jesus is called God's son, the light of the world. Here you'll have the Pope. And now let's take a look at the only people on the earth that have an exclusive and personal relationship with the Almighty God of the universe that no one on the earth has ever had or ever will have this personal exclusive relationship with the God of the universe. Now, of course, we're talking about God's chosen people. First, let's look at the only real God in the whole universe. The only legitimate, de jure, real God in the whole universe, and his name in parentheses is Yahweh or Jehovah. He is the only true, real, legitimate God that exists in all of the known universe. And he has only one race of people on the earth that he only deals with exclusively. As we said, they're rightly called God's chosen people. First, there are countless articles pertaining to the subject of ancient Hebrew sun worship. The following are just two of hundreds of Bible research books and magazines on that uh, subject. Biblical Archaeology Review, the Biblical Archaeology Review, uh, page 52, was Yahweh worshipped as the sun. Here in the article, talks about, uh, it's looking at the subject, was Yahweh worshipped as a sun? And here, the Biblical Archaeology Review, just to another biblical reference work. And this article, Helios in the Synagogue. The sun god was a popular subject in ancient synagogue mosaics. And here in a synagogue, one of the ancient synagogues that was unearthed, you'll see Helios, the Greek god of the sun, with his horses pulling the sun across the sky, and around him with the twelve signs of the zodiac. That's what uh, the worship of the ancient Hebrews was all about. Here in the, the catacombs you will find one of the old churches where they actually chiseled into the ceiling the old sun. The, the, the concept of God's Son overseeing the worshipers in the synagogue. So, the temple, we're talking about the Hebrew temple, the Temple of Solomon. The temple was laid out on an east-west axis with entrance to the east. Some have suggested that this permits, permitted the sun to illuminate the inside of the temple on the first day of autumn and that this was related to the solar cult, or festival, of Yahweh's enthronement. Here again, we see the solar cult in the ancient world, a festival which worships Yahweh, the Hebrew god Yahweh's enthronement, in the sun. Again, we see in the synagogues on the floor, the sun god with the four horses. So, we see it here on the uh, <clears throat> sarcophagus in Israel, the sun god. Here is a doctoral thesis. The book is rather expensive, but you can buy it. It's called Yahweh and the Sun, Biblical Archaeological Evidence for Sun Worship in Ancient Israel. <clears throat> here we have some of the... Uh, some of the subjects, archaeological evidence, the solar symbol of the royal Israelite seal, the royal emblem of the king of Judah, sun disk, solar orientation to the cultic structures, 
the expression Yahweh of hosts or the host of heaven. Uh, chapter 3 talks about the sun worship of the Deuteronomic history and chronicles, some worship in the prophets, some worship in the book of Job and in the book of Psalms. This is a doctoral thesis on sun worship and the worship of Yahweh, Jehovah. The origins of the solar imagery or goes back to the Egyptian sun beetle or the Scarabasaka. The sun beetle represented the sun in ancient Egypt. It was incor incorporated into Judaism. The sun beetle, the beetle of the sun. And so the idea of the sun was then incorporated into the Jewish religion, where now Yahweh, Jehovah, the God of the Hebrews, is always, and I do mean always, pictured <clears throat> as a sun god. The God of the sun. Tetragrammaton. You will see every time Tetragrammaton, which is the four letters for the name of God, of God's name, is always in a sun. Always. There's virtually never a time you will ever see the Tetragrammaton, symbol for God, or the name of God, that is not in a sun. You see it everywhere in synagogues, both at the top <clears throat> and the bottom. <clears throat> everywhere you look, you will always find Yahweh in the sun. Tetragrammaton, Jehovah, sun worship. We could go on for hours just showing you Yahweh, Jehovah, being represented as the sun. It's Moses praying to his God, the sun. As I said, virtually nowhere does Yahweh or a tetragrammaton appear that is not in the sun. And then the scripture says, for Yahweh is a sun and a shield. Well, that's exactly right. The Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, is the sun. On the book. So everywhere you see the point being made, the Hebrew God is always connected to the sun. So therefore, Christianity coming out of the sun, or out of Hebrew religion, it's only right that the Christians would continue that same worship of the sun and call it Jesus. Here we have a picture of sun worship at the Jerusalem temple. And still today, sun worship continues in modern-day Israel. The more things change, the more we stay the same. In Israel, there's a celebration waiting for the rising of the sun. A very big occasion when Jews in Israel praise the coming of God's Son, Yahweh. Jehovah, the sun. So, some worship is all over the world. Here's a group of Jewish young people in Washington, D.C., celebrating the risen sun. Incidentally, that Washington Monument in the background is an Egyptian obelisk. Egyptian obelisks were a male erection. They connected directly to the female ovaries. So the symbol in Washington, D.C. for that symbol in the background, Washington Monument, is the male erection connecting to the oval office, the female ovaries. And the sun, of course, is the progenitor of life. That's why we are still dancing in circles, 
welcoming God's Son, the light of the world. Sun worship is a very old religion, dating back thousands of years before the Roman Empire. Here we see the old Babylonian kings worship the sun god Shemesh. Sun worship was everywhere in the ancient world. Here are the old Assyrians, and the ancient Assyrians, Phoenicians, uh, Canaanites, all of the ancient cultures had symbols of the sun. You will see the uh, on the helmets the rising sun. Rising sun symbols on helmets. The Rome in the Roman Empire, the Romans had the rising sun symbol on their helmets because it was Rome was the center of sun worship, still is today. We call it the Vatican, and they're still worshiping God's sun, the light of the world. Now let's look at the sun worship today and its ancient foundations, the cult of Solus Invicti. It was a cult of sun worship. Sol was Latin for the sun, and Invictus is victorious. The idea being that the sun, even though every single year the sun dies in winter, from the viewpoint of us in the northern hemisphere, every year the sun goes south and dies in winter. But eventually it will come back, for he promised he would return. And it does come back every year. So even over death, in the death of winter, he is victorious. God's sun is risen again. He comes back to the northern hemisphere. So there was a cult that realized that the sun was victorious over death. The sun, Saul, Latin for the sun. As I said, he roams across heaven with his four horses pulling the sun. Now we note that the emperor wears a radiated, radiated uh, sun crown uh, worn by also by the gods. The sun crown was um, what we call today the crown of thorns. So here it is in the old Latin in the Roman Empire dedicated to Solus Invicti to the sun worship in ancient Rome. Here's the sun god. You will see the uh, crown of thorns. The crown of thorns is a sun rays from the sun god. Uh, here's another doctoral thesis called the Cult of Solus Invicti. And in this uh, doctoral thesis, talks about the sun cult of the first century of the empire, political background of the sun cult, the establishment of the cult of Solus Invictae in Rome, the dogma, the continuation of the cult of Solus Invictae, the spread of the cult. Solus Invictae was Mithra, that Solus Invictus is the true Roman sun god. So Rome was, was heavily involved and Mithra, M-I-T-H-R-A, Mithra, and Solas Invicti, which was nothing more than sun worship. And, of course, Roman sun worship can be traced back to the ancient Egyptian sun god, Ra. The ancient sun god in Egypt, amun Re, Amen, Ra. Re, Ra, from which we get our word sun ray. The cult of sun worship in Egypt, the cult of Amen Ra, Amen Re, the sun god, Amen Ra. Here we have uh, Amen Re, the Egyptian sun god, supreme god of the universe. This is why Christians, at the end of their prayer, will always say Amen. Because the ancient Egyptians said nobody, at no time, can ever see God. But you can see his son, and his son was called Amen Re, like Sun Re, Amen Ra or Amen Re. And so, at the end of the prayer, you're not you're praying to God, but you'll never see God, but you will see his son. So, at the end of the prayer, you send your prayers to God Almighty through his son, Amen Ra. And at the end of your prayer, you say, Amen. 
And today, in our supposed modern world, the Christian church, both Catholic and Protestant, refuse to give up their pagan sun cult. Here's the Holy Father, you will see, the sun. He wears the sun because the Vatican is the center for Western civilizations, ancient pagan sun worship. And the people, interesting enough, the people of the world love, <clears throat> the people of the world love to waller and the ancient pagantry of sun worship. The people demand it and they love it. Here's another Pope. You'll see on his uh, glove, you'll see the sun on the churches that we said before. You'll see the sunburst. Here's another church. At the top, you will see the sun. People have no idea in the world that they're going to churches, never realizing for a moment that all that their life is given to is an old ancient pagan sun worship. On the church you will see the sun, altars you'll see the sun, behind the priest you'll see the sun on the cross, the sun on his glove, the sun on the altar, Jesus is God's son, Christian son, here's the hymns to the sun, St. Francis of Assisi, famous hymn of the sun magazine called the Catholic Sun, Christian country Sun, Christian County Sun. Here's a Christian Sun symbol. It's everywhere in the church and it's only right because the whole of the Christian church is actually sun worship. Interesting, in the Catholic Church, in the Vatican, you will see um, the sun being led to the cross. It's an actual sun. And then, uh, here as the Pope, when the Pope comes, uh, came to New York, you will see the sun in front. Now, in the Vatican, as we said, the, 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 the whole focus of the Vatican is the back part of the sun. But it's interesting, too, here we shall obtain, uh, the, the caption says, we shall obtain the excellence of virtue with the grace of God and the effect of our will. And the angel is pointing the Christian to his father, to his God, the sun. Now here is an interesting um, sculpturing at the Vatican. I was at the Vatican. I saw this in person. Fascinating, because at the Vatican you have on the right-hand side uh, Virgo the Virgin, one of the constellations of the of the twelve constellations of the zodiac is Virgo the Virgin, and the Virgin is holding her son. Quite literally the sun. So in the Vatican we have the, the Blessed Mother or the Virgin holding God's Son, the light of the world. This is the Vatican. So when the sun rises in the morning it's viewed symbolically as the newborn sun or S-O-N. No, the newborn S-U-N. So the sun in the morning is always the newborn babe. It's newly born, and that's why you will always see pictures of uh, children's magazines, of Christian magazines. Jesus is always pictured as a son. All the animals coming to see God's son. The Savior is born, and as I said, of course, the son is your Savior. It provides you with food and energy and light and warmth and all life on the earth is sustained by the sun. And it is said in the ancient world that the sun 
was pure energy, and energy is light. So if the sun did not give its energy to out freely to everyone, it would last probably forever. But the sun is very generous. It gives us energy to the whole solar system. It gives us energy to the whole world. So therefore, God's Son is giving His life so that you might live. The S-U-N. God's Son gives His life, His energy, so that you might live. Everywhere you turn, you will see always the baby Jesus represented as a son. You will notice that the baby Jesus' hair is golden. That's always interested me. Why? Because he represents God's son. So the baby is always golden, glowing golden. The reason why is because Jesus symbolically represents the sun. Always the old petroglyph sun. Now here are a few pictures of the Virgin, which is again one of the twelve signs of the zodiac. It's called Virgo, the Virgin. Here are just a few pictures of Virgo, or the Virgin, holding her son in her arms. She's holding her son. She's holding her son. She's holding the son. Both baby Jesus and the grown-up Jesus are trying to show you what it all symbolizes. Sun worship. If you just... Take a moment and look at the symbols. Both the baby Jesus, you'll see the sun. The baby Jesus at the Vatican is holding up the sun. And the mother is, of course, as we said, Virgo, the virgin. So Virgo, the virgin, has given birth to her son, the sun in Virgo. The Vatican is trying to tell you, and the statue is trying to tell you, it's sun worship. Here's the adult Jesus showing the sun. So, both baby Jesus and grown-up Jesus try to show you it's sun worship. Well, go back to the old Hebrews, and that was sun worship. So we have sun worship all over the world, so many people have no idea in the world that they're worshiping a god of the sun, the sun god. You'll see the sun behind God the Father, the old petroglyph sun. You'll see these uh, sun gods everywhere. We can get into that another time. So the bottom line on all of this is Sunday when you go to church, just remember, you go to church on Sun Day, the Day of the Sun. We have a lot more to say on this subject. There's going to be another video, or three or four videos are going to be released on this subject. We have only just begun to look at Christianity, Judaism, and the foundations of sun worship. This is Jordan Maxwell and thank you for listening. Now in part one of this multi-part series we saw how the most ancient symbol of the sun, the old petroglyph sun, evolved into the central theme of both Christianity and Judaism. And along with that ancient sun symbol there was also evolved, obviously, sun gods. Over thousands of years there arose at least 37 different sons of God. S-U-N. Here's a list of 37 sun gods. Gods of the sun who died, was resurrected. 
Uh, most had a mother who was a virgin, <clears throat> had 12 followers. 37 different religions have sun gods and gods who died on the cross. Let's take a look at some of these sun gods, or shall we say suns, S-U-N, of God. Ancient sun gods with the radiating of the sun. Here's a radiating sun god, an old petroglyph stone. Here's a petroglyph sun man. Keep it in mind, these, these paintings and carvings are thousands of years before Christianity. Here's a Mesopotamia worship of the sun god. Zoroastra, Zoroastrian sun, ancient sun gods always had uh, the spokes of the sun radiating from their head, which we said before as the crown of thorns. Let's start with the ancient Hindu sun of God. Here's a sun, here's a sun of God, S-U-N, another sun god. You'll see the sun uh, behind the god's head showing that it's actually a spiritual, it's a manifestation of the sun in a god. The sun is always God. Everywhere you see gods of the ancient world, they always represented the sun. It was called, quite simply, Sun worship. Pre-Christian sun worship in eastern and southern Slavic areas of the world, Eastern Europe, Chinese. Here's the sun god appearing to one of his followers. The ancient Egyptians had sun gods. Here's um, the Horus. The falcon wearing the sun disc. The ancient Greeks and Romans had sun gods also. In Greek, Jesus is sun and Helios is the sun. Here in the uh, in the Jewish uh, synagogue, we have Helios, the sun god, on the floor in a Jewish synagogue. Is Helios or Apollo or Sol, the sun, the sun god, riding across heaven? So basically, what I'm saying is that the ancient world represented the sun in its personification and made the sun into a person to be worshipped, and that person became a god. And so we here we see the sun with the sun rays, with the horses pulling the sun across the sky because they believed the sun roamed across the sky with horses. That's the only way they knew how to transport anything was on horses. So they said horses pulled the sun across the sky. Here in the Vatican, you will see Helios, the sun god, in the Vatican. Here's a Roman sun god, Mithra. Again, you'll see the crown of thorns. The crown of thorns was nothing more than the sun rays. The pagan sun god Mithra, also known as the invincible sun, because the sun always comes back from winter. It dies in the winter, but it always comes back to us. And it's, it's only supposed to come back because he said he would return. Well, he does. Every year in the spring, God's sun, who was dead in the winter, as far as we're concerned, in the northern hemisphere, the sun was dead in winter. But he springs back to life in spring, so he's our risen Savior. Of course, the sun is your risen Savior. If it doesn't rise, we're dead. So these are all pictures of ancient sun gods. Mitra, the sun god. The old Mesoamerican sun gods, also in Central and South America, they had sun gods. Aztec and Mayas, which we saw in the first video, you'll see uh, the sun on the altar. There's sun worship in Peru, the universal worship of the sun god of the Sola deity, crawling on the knees to the sun. Here's another picture in South America of the ancient South American tribes 
worshiping the sun on the altar. Sun gods were everywhere. Nothing new. Quetzalcoatl, sun god. The Native Americans had sun gods too. The sun, the, the sun god's children. Native Americans would call the sun god's children. They had the uh, they had their own sun gods, as you can see. Orientals they had sun gods too. Here in Korea, they got their sun god who came from heaven. He just dressed like all the rest of them. In China, the solar deity. Japan, solar worship of the sun. The Mormons have a sun god too. The Mormons always had the sun. Sun's everywhere in the Mormon church. Political sons, of course, they always have political sons of God too, sun gods. Uh, Japan's emperors worship the sun and and the um, dictator, the murderous dictator who killed more human beings on the earth than anyone in the, the history of the world, Mao Zedong, killed more human beings, more millions than anyone else on the earth. And he is a sun god. The Buddhists also have suns, sun gods. Buddha was also a sun god. As a matter of fact, um, <clears throat> all through Buddhism, all their gods will always be sun gods. Then we have both Jesus and Buddha, both doing the same thing. On the left you see Buddha coming to uh, to help a poor, sick person. Buddha comes in to look after a poor, sick person. And here on the other right-hand side, you'll see Jesus comes as a sun god to help a sick person. So it's the same idea. Jesus as God's son, S-U-N, son God. Now let's look at Jesus as the son of God. There's a very important book called Jesus Christ, Son of God. You need to get the book. You can order it from uh, anywhere. You can order it from bookstores. Jesus Christ, Son of God. Ancient Cosmology and Early Christian Symbolism. <clears throat> so, what we're saying is that Jesus is a metaphor. The word Jesus, the person of Jesus, we're actually talking about the Son. <clears throat> That's why it's called God's Son, the light of the world. And Jerusalem, where Jesus was supposedly born or, or died, one of the two, you'll see it's the Son symbol. Always Jesus is referred to and shown to be a sun god. All churches always picture Jesus. <clears throat> Everywhere and every time in every church, always a sun god. So, the idea being very simple, <clears throat> here we have uh, Jesus again, the Sun God. The crown of thorns is, of course, the sun rays. The old petroglyph cross, petroglyph cross behind his head, Jesus is the sun. We have, quite literally, thousands of pictures from uh, magazines, periodicals, Christian magazines. Uh, in the Christian Bible story of Jesus, something very interesting is said by Jesus. He wanted to gather his people under his wings. 
That's a scripture that says that. In Luke 13.34, in the New Testament, in Luke 13.34, says, Jesus, this is Jesus speaking, and Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, your people have killed the prophets and have stoned the messengers that were sent to you. I have often wanted to gather your people as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you wouldn't let me. The New Century Version of the Bible says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you killed the prophets and stoned to death those who were sent to you. Many times I wanted to gather your people as a hen gathers her chick under her wings. The reason he said this is because in the Bible, Old Testament, the Messiah was understood to be the Son with wings. Here in the Old Testament book of Malachi, Malachi 4, 2, uh, says this, but for you who fear my name, the Son, S-U-N, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. It's in the book of Malachi 4.2 that the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. Here's the New Living Translation. But for you who fear the name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. Healing and his wings, sun. Well, where did we get that idea of the sun with wings? Where did it come from? It came from the ancient, very ancient world, where the ancients always pictured the sun having wings. The ancient Egyptians had suns with wings. In Egypt, the sun had wings. So the sun among the stars. Well, of course the sun is among the stars. So we see a picture of the sun in the heavens among the stars. This is why we picture Jesus hanging on the cross because he represents the sun among the stars. Jesus is God's son. The rays of the Egyptian son of God was copied by the Christians. On the right hand side you will see the Pharaohs offering up uh, an offering to the sun as the sun reaches down with his uh, rays to bring light and warmth to the world. On the left hand side you will see in the Christian uh, art artwork God's son Jesus the sun is also reaching down with rays the same as the Egyptian Christianity copy. On the left hand side again you will see the Pharaoh with the sun reaching down with his rays. On the right you will see the Middle Ages in the church. At the top you'll see the sun reaching down and touching all of the apostles just as the sun in Egypt. It's all sun worship. Here you'll see another example and another, the Pharaoh with the sun rays, and Christians with the rays of the sun hitting them, God's sun and his rays. It's everywhere in Christianity, the same concept. So, that's where we get so many of our teachings from in Christianity as from Egyptian sun worship. Some early Christians were following a different sun god instead of Jesus. His name was Apollo. 1 Corinthians 1.12 in the New Testament Bible, in the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1.12 says this. The Apostle Paul said that they have said that some of you claim to follow me. The Apostle Paul was writing this. And he said, they have said some of you claim to follow me. Paul while others claim to follow Apollos, or Peter, or even Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, so this is what I mean. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Apollos. Another says, I follow Peter. And another says, I follow Christ. Who is this Apollos? 
I know who Peter was and who Christ was and who the Apostle Paul was, but it says, I follow Apollos. Well, Apollos is another, this is in the New International Reader's Version, uh, another says, I follow Apollos. Well, Apollos was, 1 Corinthians 3, 4, Apollos was a sun god. You see he's holding the, the sunflower. Apollos was a sun god. Others claim to follow Apollos. So it's saying that in the early Christian congregation, there were some who were following Apollos, the sun god. Here in the church is Apollo, the sun god on one facet of the pagan trinity, in the cathedral of St. Peter and St. Mary in Cologne, Germany. So in the modern-day churches, you will see the sun gods in the churches. There's Apollo, God's son, the light of the world. Now, we all know that Jesus is said to have died crucified on a cross. However, there were other saviors and messiahs who also died on a cross. We have Jesus dying on the cross. As I said to you before, we have 37 different messiahs who died. 37 different sons of God who died. There was actually world 16 crucified saviors by Cursed Graves. Interesting book showing that there were like uh, 15 different major religions of the world had, uh, had messiahs who died on a cross before Christianity. So let's start with the crucified Krishna, or Christ, of ancient India. This is where we get the word Christ. Basically, it comes from the same concept of Krishna, or Christ. Christ and Krishna. We're talking about the same sun gods. In the book, The Hindu Pantheon, by Sir Edward Moore. This is a very big old book, uh, which I have a copy. It's called the Hindu Pantheon by Sir Edward Moore. And in here we have a picture of the crucified Krishna. It says crucified Krishna, crucified in space with the solar radiance above him. Krishna, <clears throat> which was the Christ of ancient India. There is Krishna crucified in space. We're talking about Krishna, of the Hindu God who died and was crucified. Looks kind of like Jesus. It's because it's one and the same. Krishna or Christ. Same thing. It's the sun. Sun worship. Next, Isus or Jesus of the ancient Celtic Druids. This is Jesus of the Celtic Druidic peoples. And incidentally, the Celtic Druidic peoples had Jesus dying on a cross. Not Jesus, Jesus. The man who dies on the cross. And you will see the round circle in yellow. That's the sun dying on the cross. A few more. Here's Bacchus Dionysus, the god of wine. He's dying on the cross. Here's another Greek god who died on a cross. Aztecs, Mayas, and, Hin and, and the Incas also had gods. This particular one dies on the cross. As I said, there's a pre-Christian sun god in in Eastern Europe, pre-Christian, sun gods. There's another pre-Christian god dying on a cross. And while we're on the subject of crosses, today wearing crosses as jewelry. You see so many uh, people today wearing crosses and earrings, uh, and jewelry and earrings, crosses around the neck, we think this is very holy and very righteous. Well, in point of fact, actually, uh, there's nothing holy about cross earrings or, or bracelets or anything else. 
because crosses as earrings and necklaces were worn by pagans a thousand years before Christianity ever happened. A thousand years before Christianity, the Egyptians worshipped and used the cross. Here is an old ancient pagan cults from thousands of years before Christianity and these ancient Assyrian pagan gods uh, were wearing crosses around their neck. This is a very ancient uh, idea of wearing a cross around your neck. Pagans wore crosses around their neck. Pagans in the ancient world wore cross earrings. <clears throat> Pagan priests had their garbs and their clothing with crosses. This is, <clears throat> this is 1500 years before the Christian era. And you will see they're wearing crosses around their neck. And the priest is wearing crosses on his garb. Nothing holy about this. Ancient sun worship. Well now let's go back to the Christian sun worship. But let's start with the Catholic Church first. The single most important symbol in the Roman, ancient Roman sun cult, known today as the Roman Catholic Church, is the symbol of the body of Jesus Christ. That symbol is called a monstance. This is very important, so let's go back over that. The single most important symbol in the ancient Roman sun cult, known today as the Roman Catholic Church in Rome, is the symbol of the body of Jesus Christ. The symbol of the body of Jesus Christ in Rome today is called the monstens. A monstens is the symbol of the sun. It's called a monstance. It symbolizes the presence of God, Jesus. Jesus is the Son. Jesus is God with us, a monstance. So, the monstance symbolizes the presence of Jesus, and of course Jesus is sun worship. So therefore it's only right that the monstance would be a glorious sun, that the Pope and the Vatican and the whole Christian world is leading multiple millions, if not billions of people, and their sun worship, worship of the sun. On the altars of Christianity, the Pope, here's this goofy, goofy old man who has two monsters. Not happy with being a pagan with one, he's got to have two. So, this is nothing more than the old pagan Roman sun worship. Everywhere you see the Catholic Church, you'll see even Protestant churches have the sun. The sun monstance represents the presence of Jesus, God's son. On the altars, everywhere you look, always they're bowing down to the sun. This is just a few of the thousands of sun pictures of a monstans or sun worship. The priest leading the people to bow down to the sun. Everywhere you look, people around the world are being led into the most ancient pagan worship the world has ever known. Sun worship. Christians will tell you that they have Jesus in their heart. How many times have we heard people say that you should let Jesus come into your heart? Your heart is in the area called solar plexus. That's why you are, we have, have you asked Jesus into your heart? Or put Jesus into your heart. Uh, keep Jesus in your heart. And so we hear Christians talking about how they have, you know, after they were confirmed and, and they, they came to know Jesus, they have Jesus in their heart. 
The idea is to keep Jesus in your heart. What does this mean? Well, first of all, this part where your heart is is in something called the solar plexus. The general area is called the solar plexus. That's where the heart is. So that's why many of the saints will always have the sun in the solar plexus of the area where your heart is. So you have Jesus or the sun in your heart. Holding the sun, Jesus with the sun. So remember, the ancient petroglyph sun that we talked about on the first video, the petroglyph sun, one of the oldest symbols of the sun in this world, the Holy Communion that Catholics take is the old petroglyph sun symbol. Well, the one thing we all know that the sun does each morning is it rises. Therefore, the sun is our risen Savior. And some of the most clever pictures people have done showing uh, a clever use of the sun in photography. And here's the priest raising the host, showing the sun and its rising. Here's the Pope showing the sun that's rising. The risen sun. 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 Always the idea is the sun is rising. And that's why it's your savior, because it is rising. If it doesn't rise, we're dead. The Pope appears to be looking to see if you've caught on to what he's doing. Raising the host, the sun. Okay, so we have more of the same. You know, there are just hundreds, if not thousands, of pictures of the old ancient petroglyph sun cross everywhere in Christianity. Always the same, the sun, the risen sun. Here's a clever picture of someone holding the sun, just like Jesus holding the sun. Holding the sun. This, uh, this ancient sun worship has been going on for thousands of years. It's still being per uh, perpetrated today, and millions of people still continue to follow Christian sun worship, never realizing that the church is nothing more than the holders of the ancient pagan sun worship. And this is why today, all over the world, Christians are praying to God for protection, for security, uh, to protect them, for guidance, etc. And the more Christians pray to their God, the worse the world becomes. The more violent it becomes, the more wars, drugs, and killings, murder, corruption. The more the, more the Christians pray to their sun God, the worse things get which proves that they're, praying, that they're praying to the wrong God. Now let's look at some of the symbolism here. Here's a human picking up the sun. This one is giving his friend the, something, the sun to eat. Here's the sun on his tongue. That's the same thing you get when you're going to communion. Whole family should receive Jesus in the Holy Communion every Sunday. The idea is the sun on your tongue. So the idea, of course, is to eat the sun god's body. This is called communion, where you actually eat the sun.
And for those that can't see very well, they make a pizza-sized sun for those who can't see very, very good. So there's a bigger sun for the old folks who can't see very well. They make a pizza-sized sun. Now one last point. God's Son always dies on a cross. Here we have Jesus, God's Son, who dies on a cross, and you'll see the sun around his head. The Son God who dies on the cross. Always the Son is on the cross. Everywhere you look on the cross, you will always see the Son. The Son dies on the cross. That's why if you drive by churches, any church you drive by to see a cross on the church, you will always see a sun, the sun and the cross, a megalithic culture of early Christianity in Ireland. The cross is the cross between the fall and spring, winter and summer. On the circle, you draw a straight line across from fall to spring and then from winter to summer, and it's a cross and the sun is in the middle. So the sun in the middle on the cross. So the sun dies on the cross between summer, winter, spring, and autumn. That's why the twelve apostles at the Last Supper you will see are divided into groups of three. Three for spring, three for summer, three for autumn, three for winter, and the sun in the middle. That's why you have the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, spring, summer, autumn, winter. In the modern day Roman solar, our sun cult, we call Christianity, you will always see the sun hanging on a cross. On the left you will see the sun, in the middle you'll see the cross, and on the right you'll see the sun on the cross. Get it? Sun, the cross, the sun dies on the cross. The old Coptic uh, symbol for the cross is the sun on the cross. So you see this everywhere, the idea of the sun dying on the cross. Always with the cross there's always a sun in the middle. Always. Virtually never do you see these on churches. The sun on the cross. That's why on all churches, as I said, you will always see a circle on the cross. It's the sun on the cross of the zodiac, northeast, west, and south. Winter, summer, autumn, spring. Everywhere you see the cross, you'll see the sun. On the altars, everywhere. Well, the bottom line, of course, uh, after everything is said and done, all you're seeing in Christianity is the old, ancient, most ancient, prehistoric ancient, sun worship. That's why Jesus is called God's Son, the light of the world. Sun Cross. So, most people have no idea in the world of what they're looking at and what they're doing and what they're worshiping because church has become a social institution. It's a social arrangement, a fraternal order, never realizing for a moment he is risen. Well, of course, that's what the sun does every morning. It rises. What is that, the sun on the cross? So I think I've made my point. Everywhere you look, you will always see the sun who dies on the cross. On his shoulder, you will see the sun behind the cross. Children are taught to pray to God's son who's on the cross. Even the Nazis have a son on the cross. The swastika is the sun. The Nazis had crosses with suns. 
sun crosses. Adolf Hitler had in his yard had a had a sunflower on a cross. This is in Hitler's yard. He had a sunflower on his cross. So therefore, when the sun goes south, December twenty second, twenty third, and twenty fourth. It's in the furthest point in the southern sky. The sun reaches the lowest point in the southern sky in the southern hemisphere. A, there is a constellation of stars called the Southern Cross. So, I think by now you get the point that the Christian sun, S-U-N, of God, and how he dies on the cross. The next video to follow will be part three of understanding hidden symbols in the Bible. We'll have a lot more to show on to you on this subject, not on what we have just talked about, but on some totally different uh, views of some other symbols dealing with sun worship in the church that you probably have never even suspected. So part three will be coming out soon, and part four at least two more videos on this general subject of understanding hidden symbols in the Bible. Christianity and Judaism is nothing but sun worship. Thank you for listening. This is Jordan Maxwell. The name of this video is, If Christ Be Not Risen. This is a quotation taken from the New Testament in the Bible, where the Apostle Paul at 1 Corinthians 15, 14, says this, And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. In 1 Corinthians 15, 14, and a different version of the Bible, says, and if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain, and your faith is also vain. What this is basically saying is that if Jesus Christ was not raised from the dead, then the religion based on him and the faith is also in vain. So I want to take a look at this subject of if Jesus was raised from the dead. If Christ be not risen. Now in part one of this multi-part series, I showed the basic foundations of Western religion to be the age-old conflict between the sun as the light of the world. Of course the sun is the light of the world. And the light of the world, God's son, had an evil counterpart. He was referred to in the Bible as the Prince of Darkness. You simply put the letter D in front of the word evil. It becomes devil. 
So the concept which is the laying the foundation for Christianity and Judaism, both the Old and the New Testament, and the very conceptual ideas which lay the foundation for ancient Western religion, is basically boils down to one idea, a war between light and darkness. Ancient man in the prehistoric world realized that during this day, the warmth of sun gave life and, and light and protection, and he could see and operate, but at night, the predator animals came out. It was cold and fearful at night. So the ancient peoples realized the greatest enemy to the human race was darkness. So there's always been this war between the light and the dark, between daylight and nighttime. On the one hand, you see the sun. On the other hand, the moon representing the night. This is the foundation for Western religion. The war, which is a 24-hour war in heaven, between God's Son, the light of the world, and the Prince of Darkness. And in Egypt, the Prince of Darkness was called Set, S-E-T, which even today, we say it gets dark at sunset. So, the idea being as that there's a war going on in heaven, as it has always gone on in heaven for as long as man has been on the earth, they realize that there's a heavenly war, a conflict going on between God's Son and the Prince of Darkness. This is why Jesus is referred to as God's Son, the light of the world. And his battle, which is a continual battle with evil, which is the Prince of Darkness. The idea based the fundamental principle in Christianity is the war in heaven between light and darkness. On the one hand, God's Son, the light of the world, represents symbolically as a metaphor intellectual, spiritual freedom of thought, intellectual, spiritual enlightenment based on intellect, based on study, based on the ability for the human, the human being to use their minds to educate themselves, to enlighten themselves, and to become a better human before their Creator. So Jesus represents God's Son, the light of the world, which represents spiritual and intellectual enlightenment, as opposed to the Prince of Darkness, which is ignorance, ill-informed, criminality, stupidity, and human imperfections. So there's a war going on in heaven continually before light and darkness. You'll see it, the concept even better when you understand that one half of the earth, as we said, is in light, always at war with the prince of darkness, symbolically speaking. Then in part one of this multi-part series, I also showed that the most ancient symbol of the sun, that symbol is referred to as the petroglyph sun. These ancient sun symbols are dated back as far back as eight to 12,000 years ago. Here is a classic example of an old ancient sun symbol. It's an equal arm cross within a circle. Very simple. This one we refer to as the wheel cross or the sun cross. Keeping in mind that these are very ancient symbols for the sun. Here in Sweden we have a 12,000 year old Swedish rock painting with a sun cross. Here is another example of the old petroglyph sun. Petroglyph, circle cross, sun cross. The ancient peoples, the prehistoric peoples of the world, seemingly all drew and painted pictures for the sun as an equal arm cross within the circle of the sun. 
and we see how the whole world still uses the ancient petroglyph sun symbol to this very day. The French use it on their military caps. The Queen Mom uses it on her medals. The kings and rulers and emperors of Europe always showed that they were ruling by divine right. The rulers of Europe and the kings and rulers and potentates and popes and clergy have a divine right to rule based on the right that was given to them by God's Son, the light of the world. And to explain to you where their right to rule you comes from, they show you the old, ancient, 12,000-year-old symbol for the sun, the S-U-N. Not Jesus, the sun. We even have in Catholic publications God the Father, who is ruling with the old petroglyph sun, which is a symbol for his S-O-N. These are sun symbols. Even today, the European Union uses the old petroglyph sun. The Ku Klux Klan uses it. The old Celtic Druids of Europe all over Europe, the old Celtic or Celtic Druids used the old petroglyph, ancient, prehistoric symbol for the cross. And, of course, the Christian church has always used the same ancient sun symbol to represent Jesus. He's referred to as God's sun, as the light of the world. Well, of course, the sun is the light of the world. Here's a symbol for Jesus. Here's a symbol for the old 12,000-year-old petroglyph sun. Put them together and you will see that Jesus is being represented correctly as God's son, S-U-N. Here we have the priest, <clears throat> both in Eastern and Western religion, and Christianity, the Orthodox religion. Uh, you will see the priest wearing the old petroglyph sun, the priest of the sun, sun worship. Here on the left you will see in the Catholic Church the priest is raising the host, which is a ritual showing that the sun is rising. Therefore the sun is our risen Savior, and the sun in the church is rising toward the great sun in heaven. God's Son is in heaven, the old petroglyph cross. And of course the Son is in heaven. So if you think when you die you're going to go to heaven with God's Son, you had better go back and define your terms. Because you, don't, you do not understand the symbolism in Christianity. It is an ancient petroglyph sun symbol. Now on the right hand side you will see young Christians today all around North America and probably in Europe too, something called See You at the Pole. In September of each year, young people get together in schools and colleges and universities and high schools, uh, Christians do, this is a Christian celebration, and they get into a circle around the sun cross that represents their Savior, God's Son. And so it's a celebration to show that they're Christians who are following the Son, which all the Christian churches around the world use the old, ancient petroglyph sun symbol. Churches everywhere use the petroglyph sun. To explain to you, here is a Catholic on Ash Wednesday on the right. You get the petroglyph sun cross on your forehead. When you take communion in the Catholic Church, it's the old sun disc. Here in the Vatican, you will see a beautiful uh, uh, carving. And uh, this sculpture is an incredibly beautiful uh, sculpture in the Vatican. And on the right-hand side, you will see Blessed Virgin, which Mary, the Blessed Virgin, is, of course, holding her son. Look at it closely. This is in the Vatican. 
Mary is actually a virgin. This is why God's son is born of a virgin, because one of the constellations of the zodiac is Virgo the virgin. Virgo the virgin. So God's son she's holding represents the son in Virgo the virgin. Keep in mind, this is in the Vatican. Also in the Vatican, you will see a statue of Mary with the baby Jesus, who is trying to show you that he represents the Son. Then the older Jesus, he's still showing you, he represents the Son, S-U-N. We also saw that sun worship was not confined to Christians. But Jews also have their sun god, called Yahweh or Jehovah. Always you will see the four letters in the Hebrew alphabet for God's name. It's called the Tetragrammaton. And every time and in every, every instance you ever see the name of God, the four Hebrew letters in Tetragrammaton, which is the name of God, Every time you will ever see it, it is always within a sun. And on the right, you will see a picture of sun worship at the Jerusalem temple. Always tetragrammaton, God's name in Hebrew is with the sun, within the sun. Here's Moses praying to God's son, and here's the sun God for Christians to pray to Jesus. God's son behind his head shows you. A sun god. We know that Buddha, like Jesus, was also pictured as a sun god. Buddha, the wise Buddha, pictured with the halo of the sun around him, as Jesus on the right with the halo of sun around him. On the left, Buddha is attending to a sick person in bed, and on the right, Jesus being God's son, also attending to a sick person in bed. The ideas are the same. And last, we found that the Hindu god Krishna was one of the ancient models used for Jesus. Very important. We find that the Hindu god Krishna was one of the ancient models used for Jesus. So we see the links between the Christos, or Krishna, and Latin, the Christ. Christ, Krishna, Christos goes back to Lord Krishna, or the Christ One. And the Hindu pantheon, let's go back and remember that, Krishna, Christos, Christ. And the Hindu pantheon, by Sir Edward Moore, there's a whole article here about the crucified Krishna. Christ, Krishna was crucified in space with the solar radiance above him. The article says Krishna, the Christ of ancient India, who was crucified about 3000 BC, was the prototype for the crucified Jesus. Down on the bottom it says, only after the Council of Constantinople was a sacrificial human victim with the head of Apollonius of Tyana put on the cross in place of the lamb that used to represent the crucified Christ. What this is saying is that before the Council of Constantinople, there was no human or Jesus, man, hanging on a cross in Christianity nowhere. It was only after the Roman Council of Constantinople that it was decided by the church fathers they needed to put a human on the cross. This is history. And that human was, was patterned after Apollonius of Tyana. So it's not Jesus on the Christian cross, it's Apollonius of Tyana. But the whole idea of putting a human on the cross comes from Krishna, the Christ of ancient India, who was, Christ, who was crucified 3000 B.C., was the prototype of Christ Jesus. Here we have in the book, the Hindu pantheon, talking about the crucified Krishna. 
you can get this book in the library and there are many other books and reference books talking about the same thing. But you see, Krishna is Christ crucified in space. Krishna looks an awful lot like Christ because Christ, Christos, Christ, Krishna, it's all the same story. So, we see Christianity today as a retelling of the greatest story ever told. The Bible is referred to as the greatest story ever told. Of course it's the greatest story ever told. It's just a story. It's an encoded symbolic metaphor for the war between God's Son and the evil prince of darkness. And as I said, in the in ancient Egypt, the prince of darkness was called Set, because it got dark at sunset. So that's the greatest story ever told, is the war between light and darkness in the human mind. So we are left with the fact that modern day Christianity is an encoded metaphor for the symbolic attributes of the sun. Truly the sun is our risen savior, the light of the world. Of course the sun is your risen savior. It does that every morning about five o'clock. It rises and it is your savior. If you don't think so, wait till it don't come up. So the whole idea of modern Christianity is an encoded symbolic metaphor for the sun who brings light and life and warmth into the human world. The ancients every morning would pray and thank God for sending his son, our risen Savior. This is a very ancient and old religion. Basically, we call it sun worship. And as I said, Jesus is now referred to as God's son, S-O-N, but in fact, it is S-U-N. Here in the Catholic Church, we have children being taught that this is a symbol for Jesus, God's Son, the light of the world. Of course, the Son is the light of the world. Here's the Pope leading over a billion Catholics in sun worship. You do not see a man hanging on the cross. You see correctly, it's the sun. The sun has always been the central symbol for Christianity throughout the world. Sun worship, the sun. And it would follow that God's son dies on the cross, as you can see. It's interesting that on December 22nd, the beginning of the winter solstice, on December 22nd, 23rd, 24th, those three days the sun comes to a dead stop in the southern hemisphere next to a star constellation called the Southern Cross. And so for, here is the Southern Cross, and so for three days, December 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, the sun, which was moving southward each day, finally stops on December 22nd at its lowest point in the southern sky, connected directly to the Southern Cross. And so the ancient people said that anything that had been moving one degree each day southward, and finally comes to rest for three days, then it was dead for three days. And then on December 25th, the sun begins to move one degree northward, which begins its annual journey back to the northern hemisphere. Therefore, the sun, which was dead in its tracks, dead for three days, December 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, now moves one degree northward on December 25th, and we celebrate the resurrection of God's Son. 
very simple concept. On the right, on the left, you will see a circle which represents the sun. The cross in the middle, and on the right, the sun on the cross. This is why churches all over the world always show the sun on the cross. The Southern Cross constellation, when the sun dies on December 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, and on the 25th, is born again. When it begins to move for the first time after three days of death, begins to move northward. So, correctly, the sun is on the cross. The Pope represents sun worship. Everywhere you see the cross in jewelry, in buildings, you will always see a circle on the cross. The circle is the sun dying on the cross, the southern cross or the cross of the zodiac. Here children, innocent children are taught to get on their knees and pray to the sun, God's sun, the light of the world. That same great sun God who, gave, who gives the Pope and the princes of Europe, the kings and the rulers, their divine right of kings. What a shame. What a shame that people, kings and rulers and popes and clergy rule over mankind saying that they have a divine right coming from God's Son when nothing more than sun worship. Now that brings up the question, who owns the sun? Well, the Russians don't own it, and we know the Chinese don't own it, and even the Americans would like to think they own it, like they own their whole world, but the, even the Americans don't own the sun. Then who owns the sun? Well, obviously, the sun belongs to God. That's why it's called God's sun. He's the light of the world. So God owns the sun. And God's son, in the ancient language, was Iusus, I-E-O-U-S, or I-E-S-U-S. -E and we know that I's are interchangeable with J's, so Iusus, I-E-S-U-S, for the son, in the ancient language, is translated, I's and J's are interchangeable, so we change the I to J, and it becomes Jesus, or Jesus. Jesus is God's son, the light of the world. So you always see Jesus in relation to the risen sun. So this is why I'm saying that Christian churches are actually engaging in sun worship. It is here that I want to digress for a moment and bring in the Christian celebration of Easter. We know that the sun affects the earth. And that four times a year, because of the position of the earth in relation to the sun, we have something, a phenomena we call seasons. We start with spring, summer, autumn, winter. So we have four seasons. Each one is three months long. Spring, summer, fall, and winter. The four seasons of the sun. So we have calendars for our seasons, and the first season is spring. So spring is a season. It's, a, it's actually called the spring equinox. When the sun comes back to the northern hemisphere, because as you remember, it was dead in winter. But when the sun comes back to the northern hemisphere, all of life springs back to life. Everything springs back to life in spring. Winter in the northern hemisphere, as you know, can become very, very cold and freezing. Very, very unhospitable to human life in the ancient world. So winter in the northern hemisphere, we say the sun is dead and gone. As far as we're concerned, he's gone south for the winter. But, not to worry, he promised that he would be resurrected and would return again to save us from freezing to death. 
So as promised, he, God's son, S-U-N, does return to us. He springs back to life when he crosses or passes over the equator, bringing us spring. Christians call the celebration Easter, while Jews call it the Passover. Why? Because the sun, which was dead in winter, became alive again on December 25th and began to move northward uh, uh, every year, begins to move northward, so we celebrate the sun is risen on December 25th, Christ's Mass, and so we see that the sun is moving northward one degree starting in December 25th, and ultimately it crosses over the equator, coming back to the northern hemisphere. And as I said, we call this Easter, or spring. The Jews say that the sun has crossed over, or passes over the equator. They call it the Passover. This is why you always see the sun in the back, when it says he is risen. Of course the sun is risen in spring. He is risen, that's why the flowers come out, everything is fresh in the northern hemisphere, and we celebrate the apostolic spring season. He is the sun and is springing back. We call it spring season. He is risen the Son on the cross. He promised he would return, and every spring God's Son does return. We call it Easter. Since God's Son is the light of the world and our seasons are caused by the four positions of the Son, this is why Jesus is symbolically God's Son, and that's why we can say that Jesus is the reason for the season. Of course, Christians sing about the birth of the king. You will see the arrow points to the king in heaven, the sun. So Jesus is the reason for the season. Of course, the sun is the reason for the season. Here we have the Last Supper, which is a painting uh, of the Last Supper with Jesus in the middle and his 12 apostles. This is as I said, Jesus represents the Son and the 12 apostles like the 12 brothers of Joseph, the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 uh, stones on the breastplate of the high priest. Look up in the Bible index and see how many places in the Old and New Testament the, the letter 12, the number 12, is used. It's used all through the Bible because the Bible, both Old and New Testament, is based on astral theology or God's Son in relation to his chosen 12, which is the 12 signs of the zodiac or the 12 months of the year. And here you will see God's Son in the middle. He is the reason for the season. Because the Son, you will see in the middle, and the apostles are grouped in four groups of threes for a very good reason. And to Jesus' right, the first apostle, you will see, is a female. It's a woman. So one of the twelve apostles or 12 tribes of Israel or the 12 brothers of Joseph or the 12 in the Bible, one of the 12 was a female. Why? It's because the apostles represent each month. There were 12 months of the year and each month has a zodiological sign. So there were 12 signs of the zodiac in relation to God's son. And one of the signs of the zodiac is called Virgo, Virgo the Virgin. God's son is born of a virgin. That's why to his right you will see a woman, Virgo the virgin. The others are spring, summer, autumn, winter. This is why you have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Spring, summer, autumn, winter. The four Gospels tell the story of God's son. 
For more proof that Easter and the Passover are just an ancient celebration of the resurrection and the return of the sun to the northern hemisphere, we need not look any further than just simple greeting cards. Go to any good store during these holidays and you will see greeting cards telling you that it's a beautiful time of year. It's called the Easter season. The season is called Easter. Season Easter. Season Easter. Season to season. Year to year. Easter comes. Easter is a beautiful season for celebrating the Savior of the world. Of course the Son is the Savior of the world. Like I said, if it doesn't come up, we're dead. So we're talking about the Savior being God's Son brings us Easter, which is a beautiful season. Easter season, season Easter, season's Easter, beautiful season, Easter season. We're talking about spring. Here in the Catholic Church, you will see on Easter Sunday, and this is why the first day of the week in Western civilization is called Sunday, uh, the feast, the Catholic Church goes on to explain, the feast of Easter. This is the Catholic Church explaining Easter. The feast of Easter is celebrated on the first Sunday after the first full moon, after the spring equinox, as the natural world bursts forth in the bright light of spring. Catholics celebrate the risen Christos, the risen Krishna, or the risen Christ, who brings them new life. So it's not the celebration of a man who died, it's the first Sunday after the first full moon, after the spring equinox. They call it the light of spring. That's what the celebration of Easter is all about. So have a beautiful springtime. You'll see the sun that was dead on the cross has come back to us. Christian, Christian stores begin having spring sales. Spring is always associated with the sun. Spring day. Springtime. Spring after spring, 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 spring. Each bright new spring reminds us that He, God's Son, the light of the world, is risen. Spring, 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 spring. So I said, as I said, Easter is a celebrating of the resurrection or the return of our Savior, the Son. Easter brings us hope that life can always start anew. Easter is the glorious sign that God is with us still. Of course, in springtime, spring and Easter, Easter, spring, Easter, spring, spring, Easter, Easter, spring, you see it everywhere on greeting cards. Easter represents a season. They call the spring season. This is why welcome Easter, welcoming spring. Spring and Easter, Easter and spring. Celebrating the beauty of springtime. So, continually we see this spring is so inspiring. So I think it is finally clear that Easter is spring, and spring is one of our seasons. Therefore, the sun, which you will see in the background, the sun is risen. And as we said before, the sun is obviously the reason for the season. Here are greeting cards with all three, in case you don't get it, with the season which is Easter and spring. A beautiful season, Easter, spring. Easter is springtime, a season of beauty.
Easter spring season. Easter spring season. And lastly, we have an ad in a magazine that says Passover, Easter, or Beltane. Beltane was the celebration of Easter or Passover for the Celtic Druids of Europe. So this advertisement is for the rites of spring. And it says Passover, Easter, Beltane. No matter what you celebrate, April is the time for rejoicing. It's just spring. So let's see what the Christians think of this idea of Jordan Maxwell that Jesus is God's son, S-U-N. All over the web, there's all kinds of comments about Jordan Maxwell. Jordan Maxwell, one one great theologian of the 10th century wrote this. Jordan Maxwell picks and chooses his words distinctly from different, distinctly different linguistic families, perverts and contorts them to support ridiculous claims. He says that Jesus is the Son of God. No, I never said that. Christianity teaches that Jesus is the Son of God. So let's go back. This is wrong. He says Jesus is the Son of God. No, the church says Jesus is the Son of God. Then he goes on to say, thus he is the Son, S-U-N. Now that's what I said. And that, Christian, uh, that Christians are worshiping the Son, S-U-N. So he goes on to say, so yes, I do believe that Jordan Maxwell has no credibility. Here's another quote, still playing with that God's son equals God's son. On PDF page 66, we hear the same old stuff from Jordan Maxwell, the same old stuff. Jesus is the son, S-U-N, the S-U-N of God, which is essentially, this great theologian wrote, which is essentially suggesting that the S-U-N of God and the S-O-N of God have a connection. When outside of some Indo-European language, it doesn't. Here's another great theological thinker of the 12th century who says, if there's anyone that's a bigger liar in comparative religions than Aktara S, it's Jordan Maxwell, who spells my name wrong, it's J-O-R-D-A-N, if there's anyone that's a bigger liar in comparative religion than Arctura yet asks, it's Jordan Maxwell who blatantly lies about things such as he does God's son, S-U-N, equals God's son, S-O-N. Obviously a blatant lie, a notorious liar, Jordan Maxwell. Another great theological thinker said, the son, S-U-N, and S-O-N, and those languages are not synonyms. They're not synonymous. They don't mean the same thing at all. Jordan Maxwell is making all of this up as a liar. So Jordan Maxwell has no credibility because of the stupid stuff about God's son being the son, S-U-N. They are two different words that have no connections at all. The two words are not synonyms. They're not synonymous. And Christians have never and would never make those connections, ever. So, he says Jesus is God's son, which is a S-U-N, and that, and that Christians are worshiping the son. So, yes, I do believe Jordan Maxwell has no credibility because the son and son in those languages are not synonyms. Oh, really? Well, if the S-U-N and S-O-N are two different words and are not synonymous, and I need to un you need to understand, I have never talked about the two words. I'm talking about the concept, the conceptual idea of the light of the world representing spiritual and intellectual light as opposed to the prince of darkness. It just so happens that we have conveniently in the English S-U-N and S-O-N, but I don't care about how it's spelled. I'm talking about the concept, 
the idea that Jesus is referred to symbolically as the sun in the sky. Well, if the sun and sun are two different words and are not synonymous, this is what the great theological, theological thinkers of the 10th century are saying, then explain this. If you're in the dark, follow the sun. Here, the sun's up. Soaking in on Sunday. Soaking on Sunday. Soak up the sun. Fun in the sun. S O N. At the beach with sunglasses. Fun in the sun. They're not synonymous. Join us for a bit of sun worship this summer. They're not synonymous. The sun did rise. Sunrise Church, S-U-N. No, S-O-N. No, it's see the sun, it's S-U-N. No, it's actually S-O-N. No, actually it's S-U-N, but here it's S-O-N. S-U-N, S-O-N. S-U-N, S-O-N, S-U-N, S-O-N. Remember, the two words are not synonymous. Here we have S-U-N, S-O-N, S-U-N, S-O-N. Rising Sun, Church. Sunrise, sunrise, S-U-N. No, it's arisen S-O-N. So sun and sun in those languages are not synonyms. They're not synonymous. Oh, really? Well, again, we have S-U-N and S-O-N. S-U-N, S-O-N. S-U-N, S-O-N, S-U-N, S-O-N, S-U-N, S-O-N, S-U-N, S-O-N. They're not synonymous. Sunrise, S-U-N, no, it's S-O-N rise. You'll see the sun rise. No, it's S-U-N. No, it's S-O-N. No, it's S-U-N. Actually, it's S-O-N. S-U-N. S-O-N. S-U-N. S-O-N. S-U-N, S-O-N, S-U-N, S-O-N, S-U-N, S-O-N. They're not synonymous. Somebody better wake up. S-U-N, S-O-N, S-U-N. S O N S U N S O N S U N S O N S U N S O N S U N S O N I have hundreds of more pictures to show you the church switches S-O-N and S-U-N. But they will continue to tell you that the sun and sun in those languages are not synonyms. Who are they trying to fool? Let's go back to Easter for a moment where we are, where we will see the sun coming up behind the trees and you will see this is a celebration of Easter sun, S-O-N. Sunrise. No, it's actually S-U-N. 
sunrise service. Actually, it's S-O-N. No, it's S-U-N. No, it's actually S-O-N. No, it's S-U-N. S-O-N. No, 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 the two are not synonymous at all. So we have S-O-N and S-U-N. S-O-N, S-U-N. Going back to this one, it says in the lower right, a unique sacred gathering abandoning all to worship a holy God. The sun, S-O-N. No, S-U-N. S-O-N. S-U-N. S-O-N. S-U-N. S-O-N. S-U-N. S-O-N. Sunrise. S-U-N. Easter sunrise. No, it's S. O N rise for Easter. Sun, sun. Here are aboard the ships in the in the Arabian Sea. The military has their military people worshiping the sun at the sunrise ceremony. No, it's actually the sun. S O N. Here it is in sunrise service. Everyone greeting the coming of God's Son, the light of the world. Here's the Sun Rise service. No, it's actually called S-U-N Rise. No, it's S-O-N. No, on the bottom left you'll see a Sun Rise Easter service, S-U-N. But here they're waiting for S-O-N. Here we have worshipers who are greeting the Sun. It's called Sunrise Service, S-U-N. No, it's S-O-N. Actually, it's S-U-N. No, they call it S-O-N. No, it's actually S-U-N. No, it's actually S-O-N. No, it's actually S-U-N. Experience the sun this Easter, S-O-N. No, it's S-U-N. S-O-N, S-U-N, and the sun and the sun in those languages are not synonyms. Oh, really? They're not synonyms? Somebody better explain to Christians what's really going on here and has been going on for almost 2,000 years. The world has been led to worship God's son, S-U-N calling it S-O-N. It's sunrise service. The ancients used to go out and on their knees with their hands folded and singing praises to the Lord Krishna or Christos or Christ. And on the top you will see the ancients welcoming God's Son in the Easter sunrise celebration. On the bottom, you will still see the pagans today waiting for the sun to rise for the same old ancient sun worship. The more we change, the more we stay the same. Here in a Christian publication that says, Christians rise on Easter to hail their risen Lord. That's right, the Christians are rising to accept and hail their risen Lord. And what do you see if it's not the Son, S-U-N, their risen Lord? Here you see the Son, the round yellow Sun on the cross, as I said. We call it S-U-N, Sunrise Service, on Easter Sunday. 
Christians go out and wait for the sun. We call it sun worship. They call it Easter. Sunrise service, the worship of the sun. Last but not least, in a very important part of ancient sun worship around the world, was and still is symbolized by. This is very, very important point, and I want to make it again, and I wish that you would listen closely. Very important. Last but not least is a very important part of ancient sun worship around the world. Was and still is symbolized, ancient sun worship was and is symbolized by opening the arms, the outstretched arms to greet the sun. This is the way all ancient cultures of the world from all over the earth have always participated in the worship of the sun with outstretched arms. We call it sun worship. Outstretched arms toward the sun, welcoming God's sun, the light of the world. Here you will see an ancient carving picture of the king on the right with his arms raised and he is showing praise to the God Son or the Son of God which is the King and you'll see surrounded by the sun rays or the crown of thorns when the sun dies with the crown of thorns the crown of thorns are also just the sun rays the crown of thorns and you'll see the Sun King is mounted on the lion, which is one of the constellations of the zodiac, Leo the lion. Disney calls him the Lion King. The Lion King movie was nothing more than the same old, ancient, ancient prehistoric, 12,000-year-old worship of the sun, the Lion King. Yes, the sun and the constellation of Leo the lion. But you will see the king is raising his arms to praise God's son. <clears throat> and then below you will see in Egypt, this is a way to show worship was raising of the hands. Here in the old petroglyph paintings, as we talked about, eight to ten thousand years old, you will see the uh, picture on the right hand side in the middle right the sun. At the very top you will see a carving or a painting of a man with his hands raised, obviously praising. And of course in the middle you will see a painting with the man's arms raised. These are like eight to ten thousand years old. Sun worship. Here in the open hands in the ancient world, it says the open hand reaching up the open hand is a universal solar symbol as seen in this African depiction with the sun. So this is an open-handed, open hand is the universal solar symbol with the sun. So the ancient and prehistoric peoples always represented in their carvings and in their paintings sun worship with the humans with their hands raised praising the sun. Now this is important that you remember this. This is at least eight to ten, twelve thousand years old worship of the sun. Here again is an old petroglyph carving and a painting of man celebrating the sun with his hands raised. In Arizona praising the sun. So, the point is that I wish to make is this. Ancient pagan sun worship was always symbolized by the raising of the hands while praising the sun. I'm trying to make the point so that you will remember raising of the hands as an ancient prehistoric universal solar symbol of the worship of the sun. The ancient Hindus thousands of years ago and still do today the same thing. 
the article says, The morning scene on the river Ganges in Benares, showing the manner of worshipping the sun with raised hands. Read that again. A morning scene of the river Ganges, showing the manner of worshipping the sun with raised hands. So you see the Hindus worshipping the sun coming up in the morning. You will see Hindus, in, it says at the top, as in Egypt. Of course, Egyptians did the same thing. So the article says, as in Egypt, on the banks of the river Ganges in India, is generally offered with hands raised and palms facing the rising sun. So, the point I wish to make is that all of the ancient cultures of the world worship the sun with raised hands. You will see pictures and paintings. On the left, top left, you will see the sun and the worshippers with their hands raised. Here we have Krishna, the Christos, the Christ one, with hands raised in India. The Aztecs in Central and South America the South American peoples. You'll see within the two yellow circles the priest of the sun and they're wearing sun helmets while the king in the middle is looking up into heaven with his hands reaching up into heaven. The king is adoration and worshiping the sun. This is called sun worship. Get it? The reason I'm making these points is because we have Native Americans worshiping the sun. We have in Egypt, as I said, the symbol in Egypt for worship was the raising of the hands. Whether you're on your knees or standing, it was always the hands were raised to worship the sun, which you'll see Horus, the sun god, on the left, and the Pharaoh was raising his hands in worship of the sun god raised hands, worshiping the sun. Now, why is this important? Well, first of all, <clears throat> you'll see raised hands worshiping the Egyptian sun god. So, why is this important? Is because this is the way the ancient peoples always worship the sun, S-U-N, with their hands raised. So it is to be expected that the pagan sun worshippers of today should continue that ancient ritual of so long ago. Even today in Israel, God's chosen and holy people, above all races and peoples in the world, the one holy people out of all the earth that God loves and protects his own personal chosen people. Even the chosen people of God are still worshiping Yahweh, Jehovah, the Son. You still have Moses meeting God with the Son. The Hebrews waiting for the Son to come up in Israel. You have the rabbis, Israel, Son worship. The more we change, the more we stay the same. Ancient Israel, modern-day Israel, the same old sun worship. Nothing holy in Israel whatsoever because there is nothing holy in the Holy Land. The only thing holy in the Holy Land are the stories. They're full of holes. There's nothing holy in Salt Lake City. There's nothing holy in Rome. There's nothing holy in Constantinople. There is nothing holy in Israel. There is nothing holy on the earth but sun worship. Worship of the sun. What about Christianity? They have the truth. No, it's still the old sun worship with the raised hands. Here is a statue of St. Francis of Assisi. And it says, the, the statue is called the Hymn to the Sun. Here is a Catholic monk, St. Francis of Assisi, with a hymn to the sun. And where is he looking? Up into the heavens, 
where God's Son is in heaven. That's why I said, if you think when you die, you're going to go to heaven with God's Son, you better go back and do your homework, because you don't have it yet. The S-U-N is in heaven, not you. You're talking about God's Son, S-U-N, with his hands raised as a hymn to the Son. Here in the Vatican, the, the article says a mosaic in the Vatican showing Irish monks raising their hands in the ancient Egyptian manner of paying homage to the Son. This is in St. Peter's Basilica. Catholic, Catholic priests and the Catholic monks are showing what they're doing. They're raising their hands and praising, and the second one has his hands closed in prayer, while the first one is raising his hands, obviously to worship in the Vatican, God's Son, S-U-N, the light of the world. Here is another stone, uh, another uh, picture from a church, stained glass window. You see the prophet is, the, the, the saint is looking up, and what is he looking at if it's not the S-U-N? And he has his hands raised. Obviously, the other two beside him are praying with their hands, and he is leading the prayer to God's Son. Hands raised, praising the Lord, praising the King, Easter sunrise service, sunrise, sun worship, sun worship, day of celebrating, a day of prayer, with hands raised to the east rising of the sun. Here's a Bible. The front of the Bible shows the, the monk with his hands raised toward what? The sun. Church of Christ group, sun worship. Here's Reverend Airhead Dingbat, and Reverend Dingbat's on the stage making millions of dollars a year, leading all of the people astray to worship the sun. The reverend is leading people to worship the sun. With his outstretched arms, everyone follows the leader. Everyone is worshiping the sun, even the dogs. Sun worship all over Christianity. Here are guys who are obviously uh, beautiful Christians <clears throat> with their baseball cap turned backwards and broken teeth and earrings ranting and screaming their praises to God's Son, the light of the world. No wonder the world is in the trouble we're in today. The whole world is lying in the power of the wicked one. The whole world has been led into sun worship. God's Son. Even chipmunks are serving God. Make sure you get the children indoctrinated with their sun worshiping. Everyone's into sun worship. Everyone loves God's son, including the pussycat, including the old praying mantis. Everyone worships God's son. It's actually disgusting and demoralizing to see how many people around the world, the church, both Catholic and Protestant, have misled the world of mankind into sun worship. There is a stained glass window of the church, and you'll see all the people out with their hands raised and the sun behind them rising. Sun worship in the Catholic Church. Even the birds. Make sure you get the babies ready for the church. Send in your checks and your money and give the church your home, and give the church your life, your breath, your blood. Give everything that you own to the church, and teach your children to prepare themselves for a life of sun worship. My God and my Lord, what has the church done to this world? Let everything that breathes praise the Lord.
on Sunday, worshiping the sun. I can understand here is a baboon with his pee pee hanging out, worshiping the sun. A baboon worshiping the sun. Here's more baboons worshiping the sun. See the connection? Sun worship, baboons. Sun worship, sun worship. Sunday worship, raised hands worshiping the sun. Even the praying mantis worshiping the sun. Everywhere in the world, Christians are being led into sun worship and teaching their children to get ready to bow down to the sun gods. Just as the Egyptians bowed down to the sun gods, teach your children to get ready with their raised hands to worship the sun. Here's one poor goofball who was worshiping the sun and fell backwards on the ground. He was overtaken by his love for God's Son. Sun worship, Jesus pictured as the Sun. It's as ancient as India, Africa, Egypt. It's all over the world. People are being led by the church into thinking that they're worshiping God's Son. No, actually it's S-U-N. Not S-O-N. So get off your knees and stop praying to God's Son and realize that the church is worshiping and presenting for you to worship the Son. Better wake up. Because somewhere along the line, you're going to awaken to find out that you have been praying to the wrong God. You're praying to a pagan sun god. And the church, both Catholic and Protestant, Eastern Orthodox, Russian, all of Christianity has misled the human race into sun worship. Better wake up. This is Jordan Maxwell.